people. So these are my three pillars for athletic performance. So in order to to, make, to gain that athletic performance, you know, we're looking at uh, a good power to weight ratio. So we need to be powerful, uh, but as light as possible. Now, regardless of what discipline we compete in, you know, we need low body fat and we need more lean muscle mass. Um, we need the ability to repair, rebuild, and recover. So for this, we need quality nutrients. We need bioavailable nutrients. And finally, we need lots of energy. We need energy on demand, superior energy, and lots of it. So these are my three pillars. Now, when we look at the standard type of diet, you know, th this is the eat well plate. Uh, the eat well mm -hmm. plate is based predominantly on carbohydrate. Um, obviously, the protein, uh, uh, the protein percentage of this is going to change depending on whether we live in a standard lifestyle or whether we are, are, are an athlete. But generally, um, it predominates carbohydrates, and this is how it looks on our plate. Uh, and we cook these foods in vegetable and seed oils. Now, I'll be the first to admit that um, you know, that looks healthy. You know, we've got chicken on there. We've got pasta. We've got some tomatoes, peas, and bell peppers, et cetera. If you were to show that to a typical athlete, they, they would yeah. assume that that is a highly healthy meal and cooked in vegetables. Definitely. But to, to look at this power to weight ratio, we need to, to be able to lose body fat. We need low body fat and we need um, high, uh, high rate of, of muscle mass, but everybody bases things on calories in, calories out. Now, energy needs to be accounted for, but the, the caloric model is highly flawed and it's, it's flawed for a number of reasons. The caloric model doesn't account for the effect of insulin, doesn't account for the thermic effect of food, metabolic rate, and ketogenesis. And we'll explain what each of these are now, but we need to understand that all carbs break down into sugar. So regardless of you know, what source the carbohydrates are, they all break down into sugar. And this sugar breaks down into glucose, and the glucose is then stored in the liver and muscle as glycogen. But when these stores are full, it overspills and stores as fat. And this is how we typically store fat. So we don't store fat typically through the overconsumption of dietary fat. It's the overconsumption of, of carbohydrate in the form of glucose. Now, this is the mechanism that it goes through. So when we consume carbohydrate, the pancreas releases insulin. It upregulates an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, which breaks the bonds on the glycerol backbone and signals the body to store fat. Now, this occurs in regardless of caloric value. If you consume carbohydrate, uh, insulin signals the body to store fat. Now, this is a perfectly normal process. But for us to burn this fat for fuel, we need to almost perform this, this action in reverse. But we need another enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. Hormone-sensitive lipase breaks the bonds again on the, on the glycerol backbone and puts fatty acids into the bloodstream. The issue with this is that when insulin is elevated, insulin blocks hormone-sensitive lipase. It blocks our body's ability to put uh, these fatty acids into the bloodstream. And in doing so, prevents our body's ability to burn this body fat. So to put this in perspective, if you wake up in the morning and you consume a bowl of muesli or some toast or whatever it may be to fuel your workout in order to burn fat, you are not burning fat because that increased insulin, uh, it makes it biologically impossible for us to burn that body fat when insulin is elevated. We need insulin to, to drop back down in order to burn that body fat. So carbohydrates fueling your workout for the for the sake of burning body fat is absolutely counterintuitive.